Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, Radio 101, What Telecommunicators Need to Know About Land Mobile Radio. This training is brought to you by Commercial Electronics. If you would like to learn more about our recording solution and third-party quality assurance services, visit comelectronics.com. This <coughs> webinar is part of our public safety education series and you can view our upcoming webinars on our training page at comelectronics.com slash training. Now before we get started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items so you know how to participate in today's event. If you're listening in using your computer speaker system, you're automatically muted to eliminate background noise. If you would prefer to join over the phone, just select the handset in the audio pane at the bottom right and the dial-in information will be displayed. You can submit questions about today's lesson at any time by typing your questions into the Q&A pane of the control panel, and Brian will address them during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Now, once you leave today's webinar, you'll receive a survey on the presentation, and we'd appreciate it if you would complete that and let us know how we did, so we can continue to provide you with relevant content. You will also receive a follow-up email within 48 hours with a link to view a recording of today's webinar. For those wanting to report this training to their state certification or licensing agency, send an email to training at comelectronics.com. Your instructor today is Brian Hughes, Vice President of Strategic Programs at Eastern Communications Limited. Brian has 44 years experience in land mobile radio. He has served as director of Asia Pacific for Ericsson, addressed state trade seminars in Europe, Asia, China, Singapore, Korea, Malaysia, and Indonesia, as well as in the US. He served eight years on APCO's Commercial Advisory Council and was a charter member of APCO's Conference and Exposition Advisory Committee. Brian also has served as the host and presenter for the Career Advancement Center, which is held annually on the floor of the exhibit floor at APCO's annual conference. So let's get started with our conference. Brian, welcome. Oh, thank, thank you very much, Beth. And um, I just want to start by uh, thanking everyone for joining in. I know these are difficult times, and uh, certainly I hope that all of you are um, healthy and your families are healthy. Uh, we're gonna start with a, uh, a familiar device. Uh, this is in fact, uh, the latest iteration of land mobile radio. I'm sure all of you have one. If you don't have one, you'll soon have one. And we are gonna talk about how this device fits in uh, to the scheme of land mobile radio uh, later on in the uh, presentation. Um, next slide. There are a lot of terms in land mobile radio that uh, at times are confusing. Uh, and uh, as with any industry, uh, we throw terms around that may not make a lot of sense. Uh, I'm also going to do everything I can to avoid uh, acronyms. And if there are any abbreviations, uh, I'm going to certainly spell out what those abbreviations uh, are. First one are channels. Channels are the assigned frequencies. Uh, many times you'll hear people talk that they have a two-channel radio. Sometimes it'll be a two-frequency radio. Uh, channels are essentially the assigned frequency. Uh, terminals, that is a term that is used for handheld and uh, mobile-mounted radios. Uh, dead spots. Uh, dead spots are areas within the network uh, where there is no coverage. Uh, these spots don't tend to move around. Uh, after all, they are, they are dead. Uh, some of them are located in places that uh, you would not expect them to be. Uh, typically, your users know where these uh, spots are. And in many instances, the cost to cure the dead spots uh, would certainly almost be prohibited. Uh, trunked, that's a term for a shared radio network. Base station, that's a term that's uh, used uh, for a, the fixed uh, transmitting radio. 
And also two-way radio is another term for LMR. Uh, you'll hear many people say, say that they're in the two-way business. Uh, well, they're essentially in the land uh, mobile radio business. The uh, next slide, please, Beth. The next slide. Oh, all right. Um, I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about the uh, history of uh, land mobile radio and also the role that the Association of Public Safety Communications Officers, APCO, uh, has played in the development of the land mobile uh, radio business. In 1933, the city of Bayonne, New Jersey, was the first public safety uh, agency to employ two-way radio. Uh, anybody who has ever flown into Newark International Airport, um, if you look toward New York City, you were looking directly over uh, Bayonne, New Jersey. Uh, prior to Bayonne employing the uh, two-way radio, uh, if starting in the middle uh, 20s, uh, patrol cars had uh, an AM uh, radio uh, in their in their car, and the uh, if you, any of you have ever watched any of the old movies, uh, you will see uh, where they say "calling all cars." Well, that's essentially what they were doing. Uh, they were calling all cars to alert them that there was a um, a situation that needed to be addressed. Uh, there were many manufacturers who made these uh, AM radios. Uh, one was a company in Chicago, uh, Galvin Electric. Um, Galvin Electric produced a product. Um, as with any product, you have to name it. It was a very popular uh, product at the time called a Victrola. It was basically a record player. Uh, since this went into a car, Galvin Electric decided to call it a Motorola. After uh, several years, the folks at Galvin Electric determined that maybe Motorola would be a better name for the uh, company than Galvin Electric. Therefore, Motorola was born, and I doubt that there's anybody in this industry that has not at one time or another uh, dealt with a Motorola product. In 1935, the Association of uh, Public Safety Officials, APCO, was formed. Uh, APCO Project One dealt with frequency allocation, and APCO still plays a very important role in the allocation of the uh, radio frequencies. Frequency coordination is much the same as an air traffic controller. Uh, the air traffic controller uh, keeps uh, airplanes from colliding, uh, frequency coordinator keeps the frequencies from colliding. In 1941, the FCC approved uh, FM radio, that is frequency modulation, and uh, they had a uh, test where they compared an AM signal uh, of an orchestra playing with an FM signal. Uh, and the folks in the room felt that with the a FM signal uh, that they were seated uh, directly next to the uh, orchestra. The AM um, signal, which is Amplitude modulation uh, has a very different wavelength than the FM signal. The FM signal uh, is more regular, like a gently um, uh, on the ocean, the wavelength, uh, where the uh, AM signal tends to be a little bit more uh, ragged. Um, AFCO 14, and again, AFCO has a series of projects, uh, standardized the uh, oral brevity codes. Uh, that are the 10 codes. Some of you all are familiar, 10-4, uh, message received. In the middle 70s, uh, AFCO uh, 16 was established. We set the standards for public safety trunking. Uh, Project 25 was a coalition of agencies which set the standards for interoperability. Uh, prior to the uh, 90s, it was possible for uh, two agencies with different radios not to be able to speak to each other. Uh, that was certainly a problem. Uh, 2012, the U.S. Congress authorized FirstNet, which we're going to talk about later on. 
And then uh, APCO 43, which was just uh, released, addresses the emergent te technologies uh, with a focus on, uh, on broadband. And we can go to the next. Um, the frequency ranges. And Beth, if you would go all the way, just release all of them. OK, we'll start at the, oh, nope, we, we can go back one. OK, the frequency ranges that are widely used by public safety, um, low band, 30 to 50 megahertz. It's usually used for long range, large area coverage, states, counties. Uh, state departments of transportation uh, use these. Uh, there are still some uh, legacy systems, volunteer fire departments. Uh, they're very common, or were very common for uh, state police agencies. A uh, high band, which is the 150 to 170 megahertz range, is used for medium range, medium area coverage, uh, cities, uh, large counties, large cities, townships. Uh, UHF, which is ultra high frequencies, that's uh, the 450 to 512 range, is usually used for short range, smaller uh, area coverage. Uh, cities, uh, New York City, Philadelphia, Los Angeles, Phoenix, Houston, uh, all employ the UHF. 700 megahertz, uh, public safety has uh, dedicated channels in that range. 800 megahertz, currently used by public safety, uh, APCO uh, 16, uh, the Sprint Nextel has some in cellular. Uh, 900 megahertz is used by uh, utilities and cellular. The 1800 is cellular, and then 4.9 public safety uh, dedicated spectrum uh, for uh, WiMAX uh, architecture. Uh, there are agencies, there are counties uh, that employ all of these uh, frequency ranges. Uh, next uh, slide, please. All right, the console equipment. And we're going to go through uh, the um, evolution of console, uh, console equipment. If you want to trace the evolution and the growing complexity and the growing scope of our industry, you don't have to look any further than the dispatch center. Uh, what we see here is a World War II uh, version of the dispatch center. Uh, you notice there is a uh, device to uh, send Morse code. We don't send much Morse code uh, these days. Uh, the next slide shows a dispatch center, uh, which would be probably the late uh, 60s, early 70s. Uh, you can see there are a number of uh, microphones, those which control um, various frequencies. You see some phones up on the top, um, and you see something that we're going to talk about in a little while. You see the coffee cup. Uh, these centers were normally uh, in the basement uh, somewhere and um, had a lot of equipment, but it certainly wasn't uh, very, very uh, well consolidated. And we go to the, um, the next slide. Uh, with the advent and the proliferation of 911, uh, the dispatch centers uh, essentially became uh, public safety answering points. Those are the, uh, the PSAPs. Uh, you can see there's a lot of consolidation. Uh, there are not as many microphones. Uh, you've got some uh, TV uh, screens, which probably are monitoring activity uh, somewhere else uh, in, in the area. And uh, again, uh, you notice there's a, a can of a can of soda. Then we move to the modern dispatch um, center, and these really have transitioned from public safety answering points uh, to emergency communication centers. Uh, these uh, uh, centers. Uh, deal with uh, IP-based, uh, some connected to the cloud, uh, next generation 911, trunk conventional radio, uh, high degree of interoperability, and they also have evolved into featuring uh, no single point of failure. 
So again, as I said, when you looked at the very early days of uh, the console equipment and look at what it is today, it very much reflects um, how much more complex and how much more comprehensive the uh, industry has become. Um, the next slide. <clears throat> I'll talk a little bit about the uh, base stations. Oh, we go back. Uh, base station, the base station antennas uh, are a very, very critical component and an often overlooked component of uh, your uh, radio network. Uh, connected to the uh, antenna is a uh, cable uh, system that runs back to your uh, to your transmitter. And I like to say that a poorly maintained uh, antenna system, including the cable, is not unlike if you were to go to wash your car and you had a hose that was in disrepair, uh, the connectors uh, didn't have their washers, you turn the water on and while uh, water was delivered for you to wash the car, there was water all over your hand, it was water all over the yard. Well, that's what happens if you have a poorly maintained antenna system. Instead of the energy from the transmitter being delivered to the antenna efficiently, it leaks out all over the place. So you, you don't gain the uh, efficiencies of, of the, uh, the network that are required. So uh, pay close attention to the antenna system and that's the whole system. And what I'm showing here are a number of antennas. One, uh, the first one, fiberglass antenna, produces what is called an omni pattern. And that is a equal amount of energy signal is sent out in, um, in every direction uh, equally. Uh, the next one is an exposed uh, dipole antenna. And what that does is that produces signal in essentially it could be a north-south direction uh, where you have a concentration of signal going in one direction and then in, in another right behind it, there's very little signal uh, that would go to the side. Uh, this is to accommodate uh, uh, you know, a unique design that you may have. The Yagi antenna is something that if you have your sewer treatment plants, if you have any monitoring of, uh, uh, for flood control purposes, uh, it is a highly directional antenna. There is no energy that is produced out the back and it points directly at the receiver uh, and in a straight line. The next one and the final one will be a panel antenna. Uh, panel, oops, we can go back. Panel antennas uh, are very, very common. Uh, I, my concentration is in the Northeast. It's almost impossible to build a tower in the Northeast. Um, so the option is to put uh, antennas on water tanks. And these antennas uh, produce no energy out the back, but they have a broader uh, range of uh, signal going out uh, as opposed to the uh, to the Yagi. And we can now go to the next slide. We're going to talk now about conventional, the conventional networks. Uh, essentially, I'm dividing it into two. One is a simplex, which is base station to units, units to units, using the same frequency. And it is, there is only one tr track going on at a time. The signal's either going out or it's coming back. And a duplex uh, slash repeater is units to units through a base station using a different frequency to transmit and a different frequency uh, to receive. Uh, therefore, you can have two paths instead of the one path in the, um, in the simplex. And if we can go uh, to the next uh, slide and Beth, if you could go another one, another one, another one, another one. All right. And let's see, is there one, is there one more? All right. This is essentially a simplex network. Uh, what you see is you have your base station, uh, your base station transmits out 
uh, to uh, the vehicles. Um, and you connect it, uh, you know, your dispatch uh, uh, position, dispatch uh, PSAP is traditionally very, very close to it. Um, as I say, you can only have one conversation, uh, you have an outgoing one, and then you'd have an in, in, incoming one. Uh, probably the most critical thing in the simplex networks is to make sure that you balance the amount of signal that is going out to match the amount of signal uh, that is coming in. Uh, it's not unlike if you had a, as a baseball player, you were uh, able to throw a ball uh, 300 feet, which an outfielder could catch, but your outfielder only had an arm that would throw it 200 feet. Therefore, there was an imbalance, and that that circumstance uh, certainly leads to uh, poor communication network. Uh, there are propagation tools uh, where you can predict the coverage, uh, but the Simplex networks are essentially uh, very simple and uh, also uh, very, very common. And then we go to the, uh, the next slide. Which is the repeater. Uh, the repeater network Essentially, uh, the radio transmits and receives on uh, different frequencies. And I think, Beth, if you hit the next uh, slide, you can uh, see that what happens is you have a uh, radio, and in this case, it's a mobile radio. It transmits uh, up to the um, base station, the repeater, uh, and on the 159, and then on the next slide, what we see is the repeater retransmits that signal on a different frequency, a lower frequency, uh, to the portable radio that is um, on, your, on your left. And then if we go to the next slide, um, and then the next one, what happens is, is that the portable radio uh, transmits, uh, again, on the higher frequency, uh, to the repeater, and then that is then retransmitted down. What this does, it allows users that are separated by terrain uh, to communicate with each other. It's not uncommon in your agency um, that you've got uh, hills or other obstructions, and a repeater is an excellent way of uh, addressing that issue. It also allows for portable handheld uh, radios um, to be incorporated uh, into, into, the, into the system. So you're extending the coverage um, with, the, uh, with the repeater. And we go to the next slide. And this is essentially what conventional radio systems look like. Uh, your agency may have uh, five channels, five frequencies that are assigned to the different uh, agencies. And then, um, Beth, if you hit it again, what we have is on channel two is we have a user who needs to get to the front of the line. Uh, but as you can see, there are four people in that line. And we hit the next slide. We have, as I say, an emergency user who is contending for access um, and having to deal with non-priority users that are ahead of them. And if we hit the next slide, what we find is that in your agencies, you've got um, unused um, frequencies, uh, and we're in a, yeah, we've got the uh, unused, so you've got channel capacity that is wasted. Uh, this is not the most efficient way uh, to use your, uh, your spectrum. And we go to the next slide, which is we deal with trunk radio. And I think that if we come away with one thing about trunk radio is that it's very fast, it's very efficient, it's very flexible, and it's very smart. Uh, and um, we'll go to the next slide and we'll begin to talk about the various uh, components. 
critical is you have your trunk radio site. And then there is over here is a control channel. Now the control channel is one of the frequencies that is assigned that is on all the time. It is constantly um, ready to receive um, anything that comes up. And I'd like it, this is almost like your ears. Your ears are on all the time, uh, listening for things. Um, and we'll go to the next slide. And you can see that the control channel, there are voice channel one, two, and three. You can have up to 15 of these voice channels. The control channel will rotate. So if control channel uh, could be voice one tomorrow and voice one would move over to the control channel. So this is what the, the architecture you have, a uh, control channel, and you have a number of voice channels that are, that are available. And go to the next slide. Now we're including the trunk controller. Uh, trunk controller is a very, very smart device. Uh, the trunk controller it has all the information necessary uh, within your network. It has the priorities, it has the talk groups, it has all the information that you need. And that information is inserted into the trunk controller uh, by your system manager. So there is someone in your agency uh, that is in charge of, in fact, making sure that the trunk controller is populated uh, properly. And now we're gonna see how this um, sort of how this works. And what we have here are three talk groups. Now, again, in, uh, in trunking, you become a member of a, a talk group. And for the purposes of our discussion, let's make sure, let's see that this is talk group one uh, would be police patrol. Talk group two will have that be the detectives. And talk group three is the uh, administrative people. And then the next slide, what happens is, this is somebody in talk group one makes a request, a request of the control channel. Now the control channel, just like your ears, simply passes that request on to the trunk controller, passes it on to your brain. The trunk controller uh, determines, is this a valid user? Is this the, you know, have the correct priorities? What, uh, what group has to be act activated and makes an assignment? Now, what you just saw takes 250 milliseconds. It takes a quarter of a second. So that, this is not only something that is fast, this is something um, that is very, 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 very smart. And then we go to the next slide, where what happens is your talk group is uh, is activated, and communication then is possible um, between that group. And we go to the next slide, and you can see the the voice messages. And the voice messages, you don't really care what channel, what frequency you're assigned. If, if we had 15 of these, you could get any one. Of the of the 15 and that's where the efficiencies come in uh, so you're not limited to one particular um, frequency one particular channel you get whichever one is available and whichever one the uh, trunk controller uh, determines that you're going to get and we go to the next uh, slide and we deal with the resource sharing. Now what we have is we have talk group one is uh, talking and we go to the next slide and we're gonna find in the, in the next slide we have talk group three. Now talk group three goes through the same process. The control channel makes the assignment or goes to the trunk controller, trunk controller makes the assignment. Now we've got two of the talk groups accessing uh, the same network at the same time. And then we go to the next one and we find that uh, talk group one, they're finished, but now talk group two 
decides that it needs to become come involved. Goes through the same process, requests a channel, trunk controller validates that group and assigns them uh, to a, a particular frequency. And again, very, very fast, very efficient. And let's talk a little bit about the, uh, the trunk talk groups. Uh, within a network, uh, you would have a law enforcement talk group, and there could be many subgroups within the talk group. You have your fire uh, talk group, and then you have your um, EMS uh, talk group. And these are essentially very, they're separate uh, within, within the network. Uh, however, there are circumstances that come up where you might have to have a uh, you know special emergency and we hit the next slide you have an emergency ops talk group now these emergency ops talk groups can be pre-programmed into the controller remember i told you that site controller is very very smart and it uh it will know when it is time to go to a particular because you'll tell it you want to go to this um, emergency uh talk group. However, there is another feature, and that is, is say you have an emergency op, and what we're going through right now with this, uh, this virus, maybe the response that you need would include somebody that's not pre-programmed. We need Dr. Fauci to become involved. So what we would do is be able to insert him on the fly dynamically. Now, at the same time, we have the road construction people, they're doing their job, the engineers are doing their job. This is all going on at the same time within the same network. But then you could have a circumstance where you have to combine the engineers and the, um, the road construction uh, folks, the public works, into a, another um, emergency type of uh, talk group. And I guess, and then finally, uh, in the next slide, you could have an all of uh, all of agency uh, common ops talk group. Uh, one of the recommendations from the 9/11 uh, Commission uh, was that including what you would not think of as traditional public safety responders in an emergency. Uh, could be very, very beneficial, uh, especially in New York City, the use of uh, garbage trucks, the sanitation department, those trucks are very, very uh, capable of blocking off streets. Uh, therefore, you don't have to be using uh, uh, patrol vehicles or uh, fire trucks or EMS uh, you know, to block uh, off the streets. So again, when we leave trunking, just remember, very fast, very efficient, very flexible, and very, very smart. And now we'll move to the next slide. And if you could hit, hit them all down to... And that, that's, that's it, good. Um, we've heard a lot about first responders, uh, FirstNet, uh, which is a first responder network authority, I uh, say it was established by Congress in um, 2012, and it has a mission to develop, build, and operate a nationwide broadband network. Uh, it's data-centric, uh, and broadband is the ability to send a large number of messages by using a wide range of frequencies. It is a private-public partnership with AT&T to build out uh, FirstNet, and all 50 states and all U.S. territories have chosen to opt in. Now, when you see some of the um, talk or hear some of the talk about uh, FirstNet, uh, there are some terms that uh, may need a little bit of explanation here. Um, you'll hear them talk about LTE. You'll hear them talk about 4G. And you'll hear them talk about 5G. Well, LTE is what is known as long-term evolution. In the early days of cellular, uh, there was GSM, and GSM is a global system for mobile communications. That 
GSM standard um, established the protocols that had to be in the cellular switches. LTE, long-term L evolution, establishes the protocols that need to be used from you, you move from one generation to another. So if, what's the difference between 4G, four generation, and 5G, the fifth generation? If you were driving a 4G car at 35 miles an hour and hit the brake, you would stop in four feet, six inches. If you were driving a 5G car, same speed, hit the brake, you would stop in one inch. That is how much faster 4G, 5G is than 4G. What does that equate to? Speed uh, increased uh, capacity. Uh, again, there's a lot of talk about for, for first um, net, uh, they're very, very prominent at the uh, APCO uh, conference. Uh, and in fact, I'm even seeing uh, ads on, uh, on, on TV. Again, right now, it is primarily a data network. Uh, the device that you saw at the very beginning uh, plays an important part in that. Uh, but they're also developing what they call a mission critical MC push to talk PTT, uh, which allows the um, first net device, uh, the cellular device to essentially act like a two-way radio. And we go to the next slide. And this question came up at AFCO last year. Uh, is land mobile radio still radio? And this question, you know, has been raised in light of, um, of FirstNet. And I'm going to say in the foreseeable future, uh, the answer is yes. Uh, as traditional land mobile radio is not in competition with FirstNet, but is a very valuable uh, complementary voice component. And again, if you see the ads on, on TV, you see people um, with tablets uh, in their hand, uh, but they are also using a two-way uh, radio to uh, communicate using the, uh, the voice. Um, will two-way radio, uh, land mobile radio continue um, in its current form? I would say for, for the next 10, 12, maybe 15 years, yes. A significant uh, investment in uh, land mobile radio systems, still very valuable. Uh, but when I went uh, earlier on, we talked about those frequencies, uh, the frequency ranges. Frequencies are like real estate. Uh, real estate is what you build your network on. Um, and I'm confident that people are going to look at some of the frequencies, some of the lower frequencies, and say, I think I can build something better on that. Let me have some of that. And so I would say that this industry is, uh, is changing. It's changing very, very quickly. And um, But at the moment, um, land mobile radio is a very complementary uh, element uh, to FirstNet, which is going to be a very, very important part of the, uh, the future. So I think we've reached the point where are there any questions? Ah, understanding device Thank location. You. Thank you. Um, Brian, um, before we get to the questions, I just wanted to uh, let everyone know that um, our next webinar, which is going to be on Wednesday, May 6th, um, same bat time, same bat channel, um, is going to be Understanding Device Location. Um, it's going to be presented by Paul Tetro. So I um, just wanted to remind everybody uh, to watch the emails and watch our website for that so you can register for that. Um, I do have um, one question, Brian, that, um, that I had when you, when you were talking about, um, you were talking about the common ops talk groups. Yep. And um, is 
is that done automatically or is that something that's done when you patch or you multi-select talk groups? What happens is that in the when the system is first going in, uh, there is a planning process where the number of talk groups are determined and it's called fleet mapping and you would sit down within the in the agency and determine um, which groups should be uh, bunched together uh, and then that information is entered into the site controller now that can change and the talk groups can be of different sizes uh, they can be uh, you know, and they would have different uh, priorities uh, depending upon the, the circumstances. Um, one thing that I probably should have mentioned I didn't is that in trunking, that unlike the conventional where we saw a person waiting in line behind users, that in trunking, the highest priority is an emergency. So if somebody declares an emergency, it doesn't matter whether they are in the lowest priority talk group or the highest priority talk group, they get through. And they get through even if it means that you have to kick somebody else off the, chat, off the, uh, off the system. So again, the talk groups are predetermined, uh, but they're very, very flexible. Okay. Um, interesting. I mean, I've heard of all of this stuff, but um, never really knew how it worked or what uh, what all of that stuff meant. So um, uh, that was very enlightening to me, um, and I appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to – I don't have any other questions at the moment, uh, but I'm going to leave this open for just a little bit um, in case anybody else wants to go ahead and send in a question. Um, but I do want to thank Brian for um, doing this presentation for us. I certainly could not have done anything like this myself because I have never understood the whole radio thing. Um, so I want to thank you very much, Brian, for doing this. And um, I also want to uh, remind anybody if you want um, information on today's lesson, um, such as a certificate, you can definitely um, send an email either to me at beth at comelectronics.com or to training at comelectronics.com. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining us. The presentation has been made possible by Commercial Electronics, provider of public safety solutions, including higher ground NG911 recording, CQIP third-party quality assurance program, and Carbine 911 next generation call handling platform. Um, like I said, I will leave this open for a few more minutes in case anybody has any questions. Um, otherwise, I hope everyone has a great day, and thank you so much, Brian. Oh, and thank you, and uh, everyone, please stay well. Thank you.